Hi, I'm Salvatore Babonis, and today's lecture is Global Social Problem of the Week, Me Too in Developing Countries. The Me Too meme was coined in 2006 by American human rights activist Tarana Burke to raise awareness of the continuing pervasiveness of sexual abuse. She meant it as an expression of solidarity to communicate to the victims of sexual abuse that they were not alone. The meme was popularized by actor Alyssa Milano in response to widespread allegations against producer Harvey Weinstein in October 2017. Thus was born hashtag me too, which is now a global meme translated into dozens of languages and reaching the whole world. On October 5th, 2017, the New York Times reported extensive sexual abuse allegations against the prominent film producer Harvey Weinstein. Now Weinstein, in case you don't know him, is a really big time producer who's produced over 300 movies and TV shows, titles you'll recognize like Pulp Fiction, Good Will Hunting, Scary Movie, Seal Team 6, and even Project Runway. Um, Weinstein, however, reportedly abused dozens of female employees and prospective employees, both famous and obscure, and I should say reportedly abused dozens, is suspected of perhaps abusing hundreds, although we really don't know. His abuse was uh, repeatedly reported to his firm, to business partners, to you know anyone you could imagine in the industry who worked with him. But due to his commercial success, people continued to employ him, continued to work with him, continued to invest in his company, uh, essentially you know, continued to treat him as a respectable member of the business community. Weinstein's seeming immunity from law and morality rested on his multiple dimensions of power over his victims. As one victim put it, you know, I am a 28-year-old woman trying to make a living and a career. Harvey Weinstein is a 64-year-old world-famous man, and, and this is his company. Uh, the balance of power is me, zero, Harvey Weinstein, 10. And I think that really encapsulates the problem. The problem is that you know, Harvey Weinstein wasn't just you know, male and his victims were female. He wasn't just you know, middle-aged and his victims were young. He wasn't just a, you know employer and his victims were employees. He wasn't just a film producer and his victims were aspiring actors. You know, he was you know, all of these things and they were all of those things. Multiple dimensions of power uh, put Harvey Weinstein in, in a position of advantage over his victims. Weinstein was even a major donor to uh, Hillary Clinton's campaigns, reportedly bundling $1.4 million in donations, mainly from Hollywood donors. Uh, bundling is a practice in U.S. politics where uh, you know, one person will arrange campaign contributions from many other people, bringing them in uh, to the, uh, you know, as donors to the campaign. Um, the Clinton campaign had been warned about his reputation, but of course, you know, when you're a famous producer bringing in millions of dollars of campaign contributions, you can get away with a lot of uh, problems. Um, due to his power and money, warnings about his behavior were ignored, and not just ignored in the business community, ignored in the political community. Um, one email from Lena Dunham, the, the uh, actor and comedian, to the Clinton campaign literally said, quote, I just want to you. Uh, I just want you to let you know that Harvey's a rapist, and this is going to come out at some point. I think it's a really bad idea for him to host fundraisers and be involved because it's an open secret in Hollywood that he has a problem with sexual assault. Yet these warnings were ignored. I think likely because of the money and the uh, the money and the visibility that he was able to bring in to people who worked with him. The Weinstein scandal instantly opened a global conversation uh, when it broke in October, but the actor Alyssa Milano is the person credited with turning it into a global meme with a tweet on October 16th uh, in which she said, if you've been sexually harassed or assaulted, write, quote, me too, as a reply to this tweet. And the funny thing is, Alyssa Milano did not apparently use the hashtag Me Too. She said to uh, write Me Too, but her tweet got you know fifty thousand likes, uh, you know twenty four thousand retweets. 
thousands of uh, women and men uh, tweeting Me Too and eventually using the hashtag Me Too uh, to demonstrate their solidarity with each other, sharing their stories of uh, sexual harassment or sexual assault. Of course, the Me Too meme quickly morphed into a global social movement uh, with much of the attention focused on the U.S. entertainment industry, but with much broader, uh, with a much broader buy-in from the global public. So we all know that at the Oscars, uh, you know, Me Too was a, you know a major theme of, of the Oscar uh, of protests at the Oscar ceremonies this uh, this month. But it's not just been the Oscars, right? It's been at all levels of society. Okay. It's important to realize that in society at large, sexual abuse is both class-related and multiply intersectional, meaning that socially excluded groups suffer multiple disadvantages, and those multiple disadvantages coalesce into extreme power differentials that are ripe for exploitation, especially for sexual exploitation. So to begin with, women are at greater risk than men, but on top of that, young people are at greater risk than middle-aged people. Uh, sexual minorities are at greater risk than heterosexuals. Racial minorities are at greater risk than whites, at least in the United States. Less educated people are at greater risk than more educated people. Poorer people are at greater risk than richer people. And these aren't just assertions. These are all quantifiable power differentials that we have data on, uh, actually, about rates of sexual assault being uh, having these differentials across all of these uh, all of these power disadvantages uh, but imagine if you are you know female young a member of a sexual and racial minority less educated poor that puts you at an extreme multiple risk of sexual abuse in less developed countries those problems are exacerbated by weaker legal protections and weaker norms of equality. Uh, women of all ages, for example, face much greater risks of sexual abuse in countries where women lack full legal or social equality with men. Uh, LGBT people and other sexual minorities are at severe risk where homosexuality is criminalized, or you know, migrant workers can be at severe risk where they don't, where, in countries where they lack legal standing or legal rights, or where their employers may be in charge of their, you know, legal status, their their visas, their ability to live in the country. Uh, you know, according to the World Bank, I'll just give some examples for each of these. According to the World Bank, there are 32 countries in which women cannot even apply for a passport without permission from a male guardian. That's more than 10%. That's more than 15% of the countries of the world. Now, India is a country, India is the, the target example here. India is a country where uh, women have the legal right to apply for a passport without permission from their husband. But there are widespread reports of courts in India and registrars in India actually requiring a husband's permission, even though the law says that women are completely emancipated in India. Um, nonetheless, it, you know, often uh, lower level officials don't enforce law and actually you know, try to prevent women from getting passports. Uh, in addition to that, India has a serious problem, like much of South Asia has, a serious problem with child marriage, and child marriage often meaning marriage of girls, of, of young girls uh, to adult men. Uh, these are rates of child marriage in India by uh, state, with Rajasthan uh, in northwest India having the highest rate, about 3%, uh, three, uh, almost 4% of all uh, uh, teenage girls uh, are married uh, as teenagers. Uh, and this is something that cuts across all religions in India. So it's not just a Hindu problem or a Muslim problem or a you know, Sikh problem or a Buddhist problem. It's a, it's a problem for all religions and all groups in India. Now, in India, there are very serious uh, efforts, uh, both by the government and by civil society, to prevent child marriage. In other neighboring countries, you know, especially in Pakistan, there's much less civil society pressure to limit child marriages. So in some, some of India's neighboring countries, the problem can be even worse. Pakistan, Nepal, uh, you know, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. 
Another example is the problems faced by uh, LGBT and other sexual minorities. As of 2016, homosexuality and, and other uh, you know, sexual minorities were still a criminal offense in 74 countries. Now, to put that in perspective, uh, you know, again, that's over one third of the countries in the world criminalized homosexuality, uh, which of course puts homosexuals and other sexual minorities at extreme risk of exploitation and blackmail. Uh, if your employer uh, has any kind of information that you may, or even suspicion that you may engage in homosexual behavior, that gives your employer you know, extreme power over you to, uh, to blackmail you into uh, sexual activities. Um, Note in this map, this also lists the countries where there's recognition of same-sex unions. And Australia, of course, since this map was made, has recently transitioned into the category where same-sex marriage is allowed. And a, a, a similar problem affects migrant workers. And maybe the most severely targeted group are live-in foreign domestic workers, that is foreign maids, who live especially throughout Southeast Asia, South Asia, uh, and the Middle East, where it's very common to have migrant worker maids from other countries. Uh, very often maids come from the Philippines or Indonesia, uh, and they're very open to sexual abuse because uh, they live with the uh, families uh, that employ them. Uh, the families that employ them have control over their visas, so if the family ceases to employ them, they lose their visa. Uh, you know, all of this puts, makes them extremely vulnerable to sexual exploitation and sexual pressure. Um, on top of that, in most countries, uh, only unmarried women are, are allowed to serve, as, uh, are allowed to be employed as uh, foreign maids or uh, women who don't have children. They're almost never allowed to have uh, you know, boyfriends or male relatives in the country. So they're effectively being set up for sexual exploitation. And this is not a small number of women. You know, in this picture shows uh, maids on a day off in Singapore. Uh, this is a practice throughout you know, Singapore, Hong Kong, the Persian Gulf, maids having only one day off a week in Singapore and Hong Kong, or maybe no days off at all, uh, where their only friends are other poor, young, unmarried women from their own countries of origin, where they have virtually no connection uh, to the societies in which they live. And we're talking about you know, several million, if not tens of millions of women, not a small number. Okay. Key takeaways. First, the, the hashtag MeToo social movement started in the U.S. entertainment industry in October 2017, but has since spread widely. Um, second, vulnerability to sexual abuse is intersectional, meaning that multiply excluded people face the most severe vulnerabilities to sexual abuse. And finally, vulnerability to sexual abuse is extreme in countries with weak legal protections and weak norms of equality where women may, or, or anyone see, uh, uh, subject to sexual abuse may not feel comfortable or may even be legally barred from seeking redress you know, through uh, the justice system. Thanks for listening. Again, I'm Salvatore Babonis. You can find out more about me at my website, salvatorebabonis.com, where you can also sign up for my monthly Global Asian newsletter.